It's been an extra long wait for Game of Thrones Season 7, but this summer, winter is finally coming back. With such a huge gap between the seasons, it's easy to forget all the little Easter eggs and book references that you memorized during Season 6. But worry not, we've got you covered. This is Kyle with Cinematica, and we've got 2020 green sight on all the secrets from last year, including the two-year-long death and return of Jon Snow, as well as the production of the massive blockbuster rivaling final two episodes. So hold on to your crowns for 100 and seven facts you should know about Game of Thrones season six. Let's get started. Game of Thrones Season 6 was filmed from July to December of 2015 and first aired from April 24th to June 26th of 2016. HBO ordered the sixth season in a bundled package with the fifth season all the way back in 2014 just days after the premiere of the fourth season. That's a pretty sweet deal. George R.R. R. Martin did not return to write an episode of the sixth season as he did in the first four seasons. He planned to use that free time to focus on writing the next damn book. Come on, George, hurry up. After sitting out for the entirety of Season 5, Bran, Mira, and Hodor finally return to continue their mystical tree plot line. Also returning from the bench are Yara and Balon Greyjoy and the Tullys, Brendan and Edmure. Jonathan Price, who plays the High Sparrow, became a series regular this season. You probably recognize him as the president from the G.I. Joe movies or Governor Swan from the Pirates of the Caribbean films. It wouldn't be a new season of Game of Thrones without some obvious recasts. Strawn Roger, who played the Three-Eyed Raven back in Season 4, has now been replaced by Max von Sydow. You may recognize him from his recent role as Lor Santeca from Star Wars Episode 7 The Force Awakens, in which he played another old mentor character. The Children of the Forest were recast as non-children-sized actors. Some think this was meant to show that time had passed, while others theorize that Leaf, originally played by Octavia Alexandru, was replaced by an older, more experienced actress, Kay Alexander, because the character was given more lines and screen time. Marcella's death was originally way more violent. At first, she was given bloody bananas as fake brains that she was going to spew all over the ship. However, the creators decided to give her a death more fitting of her life, and that's short and sweet. Book readers may have found Doran Dan Martell's sudden murder at the beginning of season 6 shocking. After all, he's still kicking around in the books. Turns out actor Alexander Siddig was just as shocked. He was contracted for four episodes in season 6 before getting the call that he'd been axed in the first episode. Amelia Clark, who plays Daenerys Targaryen, once decided to translate Hansen's Mbop into the fictitious language Dothraki and recited it during a take while the cameras were off her. Book readers have long speculated that Melisandre is much older than she looks. In the first episode of the season, it's confirmed that the elaborate necklace she never takes off is what keeps her young. Some viewers noted that in season four, one scene between Melisandre and Selyss depicts the red woman necklaceless, but still in her youthful form. It's likely a continuity error, though others suppose that Selyss is seeing her unglamorous form, but the audience isn't. George R. R. Martin revealed this twist to Melisandre's actress, Carice Van Houten, early on so that she'd be able to play the character as much older and wiser than everyone else. It's why she's so condescending to visibly older characters like Dad. To film these scenes, Carice Van Houten wore aging prosthetics and then her head was digitally added onto a body double. Director Jeremy Podeswa opted for the body double because he didn't want to use a CGI body. In the scenes where Arya is blind, Maisie Williams wore huge, white, 16mm contact lenses that actually did impair her ability to see. Fortunately, she only wore them during dialogue scenes. During fight scenes, she got a different set of lenses with holes so she could see. The makeup for the Children of the Forest was so extensive that it required required over 9 hours to apply it. If Kay Alexander needed to be on set by 9am, it meant that she had to get picked up at midnight. The show's creators withheld much of the Iron Islands plotline until this season. They cut most of Theon's uncles from earlier seasons as to not open a storyline they couldn't finish. Fortunately, Euron was always gone from the Iron Islands anyway, so his return in the episode Home doesn't feel quite so out of place. Danish actor Palu Asbeck was cast as Euron Greyjoy, Theon's estranged uncle. News of Asbeck's casting was leaked after he was spotted during a production day, so when he finally got home and checked his phone, he had about 200 missed calls and text messages about it. In the episode Home, young Ned Stark tells his brother in Bran's greenside vision, Put the shield up or I'll ring your head like a bell. A line that was also used by Jon Snow when he was teaching Ollie to fight. Keep your shield up. 
Or I'll ring your head like a bell. This subtly reinforces the fact that John thought of Ollie like a brother, making his betrayal of Snow and his subsequent hanging hurt all the more. The cellar where Daenerys stored her dragons was located in a palace in Croatia, a set that the show no longer uses. For Tyrion's venture down into the crypt, they recreated the entire room digitally. Most actors get asked for autographs. However, after Jon Snow's death, Alistair Thorne's actor, Owen Teal, was approached by fans with knives. They wanted pictures with him pretending to stab them and scream bastard at them. Yikes. Still, that's probably better than Conleth Hill's fan experience. He was approached hand first by a fan who wanted to check if he really had anything, uh, missing in the crotch area. I don't think Theon would find that too funny. Ten long months after his shocking murder, and after two years of secrecy from actor Kit Harington, Jon Snow returned from the dead this season. And what did he have to say for it? Sorry. Harrington even had to lie to his fellow castmates about his death, with mixed results. Sophie Turner sent him a long letter about what an influence he was on her and how much she enjoyed working with him, while Liam Cunningham just told Harrington to f off. For the entire season, it was prohibited to even speak the words Jon Snow on set. Instead, every script, call sheet, and scene breakdown referred to him only as LC, short for Lord Commander. Only a handful of people were allowed to know the truth about Jon Snow. Kit Harington's close friends, family, and a random police officer. Wait, what? To get out of a speeding ticket, Kit Harington actually revealed Jon Snow's fate to the cop who pulled him over. Following the success of Netflix's Stranger Things, the show's creators reached out to the Game of Thrones producers to learn about the secret code names and spy tactics that, among other things, kept Jon Snow's death under wraps. The plan didn't quite go off without issue, though. Photos were leaked of Kit Harington in Belfast with a new haircut and all new duds, starting early whispers that Jon Snow may not be dead after all. The show generally avoids using flashbacks since the creators consider it to be a lazy storytelling device. This season, however, they did use flashbacks for Bran. Apparently, Green Seeing is different because Bran's reactions to them create compelling character moments for him. The other advantage of flashbacks is being able to mess with the information that the audience thinks they know. Ned's famous sword battle with Sir Arthur, for instance, plays out rather differently than the Winterfell history books portray it. To increase suspense building up to the fight at the Tower of Joy, director Dan Sackheim took cues from Once Upon a Time in the West. Rather than starting the flashback at the duel, Sackheim rewound the clock further to emphasize the moment leading up to the historic battle. Sackheim also explained the choice to have Arthur Dane use dual swords rather than his weapon, Dawn. He said that he wanted to make Dane appear almost superhuman and that they couldn't pull that off with just one sword. The idea came from a video of Bruce Lee using a pair of nunchucks to play ping pong. The framing of Jon Snow rising from the dead was inspired by depictions of Jesus' resurrection by Italian painter Caravaggio. The director employed a heavy lighting contrast known as Chiara Scuro to achieve the desired look. Many Shaggy Dog Lives conspiracists point out that the direwolf's severed head, as seen in the episode Oathbreaker, appeared way too small to be a direwolf. Episode director Dan Sackheim admitted that he thought the same thing when he first saw it, but the creature maker assured him that everything was up to snuff. Tyrion's failed attempt at breaking the ice with Masande and Grey Worm using a drinking game is a callback to the same game he played with Bronn and Shay way back in Season 1 with quite a different outcome. To attain the sheer awkwardness of the scene, Sakheim shot Masande and Grey Worm's side first and gave them very little direction as to what they were supposed to be doing. Jon Snow and Sansa's long-awaited meetup in Book of the Stranger may be a sweet reunion, but the two never actually spoke to one another on camera prior to that scene. This episode depicts the uncanny reunion of three brothers sister pairs, Jon Snow and Sansa at the Wall, Marjorie and Loras at King's Landing, and Theon and Yara at the Iron Islands. Hey Brienne and Tormund shippers, there's a deleted scene where Sansa goes all mean girls on Brienne, making fun of Tormund's crush on her and flustering the mighty warrior. Also note, Christopher Hivew, who plays Tormund, calls their shipper name Bremond the Tarthbane. According to George R. R. Martin, Daenerys was not written to be fireproof. Her original survival at the funeral pyre was a one-time only situation, all thanks to her dragon eggs. For the show, however, they turned that fluke into a full immunity, taking her moniker, the Unburnt, literally. The show even alluded to her immunity earlier in season one when she touches her egg without getting burned. Those flames, by the way, were real. Of course, they didn't have Amelia Clark walk through them. Her part was filmed separately and added later. Apparently, even with modern technology, fire is hard to fake with CGI. Dragons, sure, but not fire. Sackheim chose the bookend Oathbreaker and Book of the Stranger with Jon Snow's icy resurrection and Daenerys' emergence from the fire. He likened both moments to a rebirth and noted that both characters are appropriately garbed in their rebirth day suits. In the episode The Door, we see a seven-spoked spiral pattern of stones surrounding the weirwood trees where the children made the first White Walker. Similar patterns appeared in the first episode of the series and later in season three's Walk of Punishment, both times made by walkers using body parts. According to David Benioff, this 
this magic icon originated from the Children of the Forest. The Bloody Hand stage play that Arya watches is pulled directly from a plotline in a pre-released preview chapter from the Song of Ice and Fire novel, The Winds of Winter. Actress Essie Davis was cast to play, well, an actress in the show. Her character plays the role of Cersei Lannister in The Bloody Hand. During that play, Icelandic band of monsters and men makes a cameo as the traveling musicians above the stage. This continues Game of Thrones tradition of having popular alternative musicians make appearances. Season 6, Episode 5 marks the very first time the Mad King ever appeared on screen. Previously, he was only mentioned in passing, but is an essential part of the Game of Thrones lore. The Three-Eyed Raven's Cave required a complete overhaul for the White Walker invasion. The set was constructed to be seen briefly and then cut away from, not to be filled with cameras, actors, extras, and special effects. The White Walkers now wear thick armor, something they didn't do in the first few seasons of the show. Turns out they learned something from their fallen brothers running with Samwell and now suit up before their invasions, just in case. For anyone who thinks that Hodor's heroic origins were made up for the show, George R. R. Martin said that this explanation is straight from the novels, and Book Hodor will soon be meeting a similar fate. Of all the things that Martin revealed to the creators about the remainder of the story, this hit them the hardest. The Hold the Door revelation was one of the three big twists that shocked the show creators during their meetup with Martin. The first was Stannis' futile sacrifice of Shireen, which we saw back in season 5. That leaves just one more big moment. Following that episode, the internet erupted in a frenzy of Hodor doorstopper memes. Benioff and Weiss even took to Jimmy Kimmel Live to apologize for the slew of hold the door jokes inevitably headed your way. A Game of Thrones fan, Tony Wang, kickstarted the Hodor, a doorstop modeled after Hodor. Unfortunately for Tony Wang, he was shut down by HBO. Luckily for fans, HBO did this because they already planned to sell the idea through another license. During the Inside the Throne segment for Blood of My Blood, D.B. Wise refers to Benjen, who returned in Season 6, as Cold Hands Benjen. Cold Hands is a character from the books, not yet adapted in Game of Thrones, and one who is important to the journey of Bran and company. There was an additional scene in The Bloody Hand that poked fun at online reviewers who have criticized the gratuitous violence and profanity of the show, in which the episode's director, Jack Bender, actually agreed with the viewers. He thought that the scene was meant to be self-deprecating, and it's very likely that this misunderstanding is why the scene was cut out. After spending the last five years in basically a potato sack, Hannah Murray finally got to change her outfit. She's the longest non-uniform character to go without a wardrobe change. In honor of Murray's new digs, she and Kit Harington played a prank on their co-star, John Bradley. The costume department threw together a horrendous King Henry wannabe wardrobe and told Bradley that he would be wearing it on screen once Sam returned home. Bradley didn't think twice about it. By his logic, maybe Sam just dressed like an idiot before going to the wall. The episode The Broken Man started with a cold open, an immediate scene before the title sequence in order to not reveal Rory McCann's name in the opening credits until after he appeared on screen. The Broken Man was written almost as a standalone episode. Writer Brian Cogman calls it a three-act play that doesn't really feel like the world of Game of Thrones until the end when everyone is slaughtered. You know, a Game of Thrones trademark. Ian McShane's character, Brother Ray, is an original role for the show, but a mashup of two smaller characters from the book, Septon Maribald and the Elder Brother. In his press junket, McShane openly admitted that his episode was tied to the return of a beloved character. Pretty much every fan realized he was talking about the Hound. McShane's response to the fiasco? It's only tits and dragons. The title, The Broken Man, is an allusion to a speech made by Septon Maribald in the book. The speech, a commentary about the sheer horror of war, is considered one of the best written moments in the the entire Song of Ice and Fire series. Unfortunately, it didn't make it past that title in the show, but Brother Ray delivers a similarly themed speech. McShane was hired for the role because of the speech. He previously starred on Deadwood, a show known for its soliloquies, so the production team knew that he was the right guy to tackle Ray's sprawling monologues. For Arya and the Waves' big Terminator chase scene in No One, the stunt team prepared many over-the-top stunts for Macy Williams to perform. Williams rejected them though, since Arya is a pragmatist and a survivalist who wouldn't do a crazy dive just for cinematic effect. This season features numerous scenes of Arya getting her ass handed to her by the Wave, which turned out to be easy for the actors since Faye Marcy was a better swordsman than Macy Williams. There was rampant speculation that the Arya we saw get stabbed wasn't Arya at all, but someone else wearing her face. Well, that theory got debunked in No One, episode director Mark Mylod wanted to remind everyone that Arya is still young and ambitious and therefore prone to making mistakes. Some fans were disappointed to miss the Waif and Arya's battle, or the Blackfish's 
final stand. Mylot explained that it was because Waif and Arya's battle was in the dark and because they wanted the Blackfish's last stand to be with Brienne, in order to leave his storyline on an emotional note rather than a violent one. Tyrion once again brings up his brothel story about the honeycomb and the jackass. He last attempted to tell it as a prisoner back in season one. He's cut off again this time, but with the addition of the line and the Madame says, the final two episodes of season six are directed by Miguel Sapochnik. You might recognize his name as he directed the episode Hard Home. Sapochnik's directorial style is notably cinematic because he is influenced by big blockbusters. Battle of the Bastards tapped into films like Saving Private Ryan, Lord of the Rings, and Braveheart. Sapochnik was determined to keep the airborne assault scenes grounded in reality. He referred to actual footage of World War II fighter planes as well as the framing of fast animals in nature documentaries in order to set up his shots. The Battle of the Bastards went by a different name on set. The horrific bloodbath was affectionately referred to by the cute abbreviation B.O.B. The battle for Winterfell in that episode was completed after 25 days of shooting and was considered the largest scale shoot yet for Game of Thrones. The battle for Winterfell featured around 500 extras. In addition, the Stark and Bolton armies were trained separately to make them more competitive while filming. The series horsemaster, Camilla Nopris, was hounding the showrunners for more work until Battle of the Bastards used a total of 80 horses, the most she had ever been responsible for on set. The cavalry charge towards Jon Snow was not done in CGI. The horses really were charging full speed at Kit Harington to make the scene feel as real as possible. As Kit Harington put it, it was terrifying. The Battle of the Bastards was inspired by several historic battles, such as the Battle of Agincourt and the Battle of Kanai. Outside of history, Sapochnik also took inspiration from Akira Kurosawa's Ran. The body piles towards the latter half of the battle were inspired by ancient and even some modern battles. In those battles, there were accounts of bodies piling up so high they were obstructions on the battlefield. Every fake body used in the pile was dressed just like the real extras. That meant that they needed the full armor, the proper sigil and shield, and the correct banner or flag. This included the horses as well. Ewan Rayon said that he always wanted to do a scene with Kit Harington. Several seasons later, he got Battle of the Bastards featuring the first and last scene with Jon Snow and Ramsay Bolton. Ramsay's face beating scene was shot for 10 hours. The director wanted to capture the scene in every angle possible for maximum effect. Sansa's final scene with Ramsay was shot over 12 times because it was important to capture Sansa's smile perfectly. Before telling Rayon about Ramsay's demise, Benioff and Wise joked around saying that it was great that Ramsay ends up on the Iron Throne. As of the season finale, The Winds of Winter, the Stark House sigil has finally been restored to Winterfell in the intro sequence. Since the Boltons took over, it was replaced by the Flayed Man sigil, and prior to that, Winterfell was shown ablaze. The eerie piano track, The Light of the Seven, stands apart from the show's typical compositions and was picked over the Lannister theme music in order to give the scene a sense of foreboding without a clear idea of which character was going to take action. The children's choir you hear in the song is actually just two boys and was inspired by the role of the children in Cersei's scheme. Their vocals harmonize and desynchronize to add tension to the sequence. The finale kicks off with little dialogue, which is unusual for the show. Sapochnik compared the sequence to the scene in Heat, where Robert De Niro silently decides to confront his partner and how that silence can speak volumes. Speaking of silent exchanges, that stare down between Jamie and Cersei near the end of the episode almost didn't make the cut. Sapochnik originally cut it out, but the creators decided to keep it. Some fans began to speculate that Jamie the Kingslayer would soon become the Queenslayer. According to Nikolai Coster Waldo, who plays Jamie, that interpretation of the Valonqar theory is a bit predictable, so keep theorizing. Cersei's immediately iconic supervillain outfit was designed with layers of symbolism. The overall look was meant to evoke the image of Tywin, while the designs on the shoulder pads were reminiscent of Jaime's hand. The dark color depicted Cersei in mourning for her children and her soul. Since the costume designers have to make everything up from scratch, they keep a file of looks and textures for each character year-round that they can use when it's time to make a new uniform. While most cast members don't learn about their demise, until just before they get the script, Natalie Dormer knew about Marjorie's death six months in advance. She wanted out of the show to pursue another role, so the creators compromised with her. Dean Charles Chapman has now filmed two death scenes for the show. In season six, it's Tommins, but Chapman also played Martin Lannister in season three, who was killed by the Karstarks in his prison cell. The show has killed off a king each season since the beginning. It was Robert Baratheon in season one, his brother Renly in season two, Rob in season three, Joffrey in season four, Mance Raider and Stannis in Season 5, and now Balon Greyjoy and Tommen joined the Dead Kings Club in Season 6. The finale finally revealed Jon Snow's parentage after 20 years of speculation, or at least it's revealed that his mom is Lyanna Stark.
Stark. The show doesn't explicitly say that Rhaegar Targaryen is his father, although an infographic posted on the official Game of Thrones website does. The King of the North scene in the finale is meant to be reminiscent of a similar scene from season one in which Rob Stark is declared king. While it's a celebratory moment, we know that it didn't fare well for the previous king, so it comes with the same sense of foreboding. Unlike her character Lyanna Stark, Ashling Franchosi got to meet her TV son. Kit Harington was on set the day they filmed the Tower of Joy scene. However, Franchosi couldn't tell anyone that she met him since at the time he was still publicly dead. Some viewers were confused when Varys made it from Marine to Dorne and back in just a couple episodes time. This is because each of the season's plot lines take place across varying amounts of time. For instance, most of Arya's plot takes place over a few days, while Jon and Sansa's occurs over several weeks. Before Conleth Hill was Varys, he was almost a king. He auditioned for the role of Robert Baratheon way back in the day, just before Mark 80. Daenerys may look ambitious and militant in the final shot on the boat, but Amelia Clark was so freezing that she found it hard to stay in character. Until Sapochnik advised her to hum the Game of Thrones theme song in her head, clearly that helped because that's the take used in the episode. As of season 6, there have been approximately 150,966 deaths on the show. That's not that many. While it's often said that this season strayed entirely away from the books, there's actually a fair bit of adapted content. This includes the entire King's Moot story arc in the Iron Islands, Samuel and Jilly's journey, and Arya's faceless men. This season featured the highest budget so far. Each episode cost over $10 million, with the season as a whole breaking $100 million. This season also broke the viewership record. It averaged 23 million viewers per episode, counting all viewing platforms. That's a 15% increase over last season, which previously held the series record. Every season has the wolf unit, the dragon unit, and season 3 brought us the raven unit. This season called in the white walker unit, which is by far the scariest sounding unit. Game of Thrones became the most awarded series in Emmy history this season with 38 wins and 106 nominations, beating the previous record holder, Frasier. This season in particular won outstanding drama, outstanding directing, and outstanding writing. In May of 2016, rumors emerged that Jon Snow would be getting a spin-off series after Game of Thrones ended. Studio executives were quick to deny these rumors, stating that before HBO made plans, they would see how the finale seasons played out and which characters were alive in the end. Once again, I'm Kyle with Cinematica, and thanks so much for watching 107 Facts About Game of Thrones Season 6. Who's your favorite character from Season 6? Comment below and let us know. Don't forget to click the bell icon to become a part of our notification squad and subscribe to Cinematica, where we help you watch smarter.